Hi, everybody. This is Alan Fine, and I'm here with Michael Edwards, Managing Director of Explore Worldwide. Explore Worldwide is a global adventure company with 40 years of experience offering more than 500 trips in 120 countries. The company recently launched 11 brand new European adventures, and we're going to find out if that makes this 511 trips here on Insider Travel Report. Michael, thanks for talking to us. Why don't we Hi, just... Thanks for having me. Let's not quibble. Let's say 511 trips, right? <laughs> let's say 511. We're, we're creating new ones all the time, Alan. So 511 is good for today. Now, the, the history of the company, I, I know you, you started, it started up in, the, I think, 81. And uh, you, at that time, there were just six tours and a four-page brochure. Tell us how we got here from there. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been an interesting 41 years. I joined the business about a year and a half ago, but I've been worked in this sector for a long time. And Explorer has been an absolute pioneer, UK-based company, but an absolute pioneer in small group travel. Like a lot of companies in our space, a bunch of enthusiasts who loved getting off the beaten track, realized there was a business out of that, as say, six tours, a small brochure, and over those 41 years, you know, we've built a really strong, loyal customer base. Customers probably 50, 50 plus seems to be the, 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 the sweet spot for us in terms of like-minded 50 plus people wanting to travel in a community of 10, 12, 14 people and really getting to the heart of a destination. So we've gone from those six trips to 511 as we're speaking today. Um, we're starting to really um, grow our presence in the U.S. market because we think our proposition is is a really good one for U.S. Um, travelers. Um, and we, we think that the, the future for our sector, you know, small group, experiential, off the beaten track, sustainable travel is a trend that will, you know, grow and grow. And I think ha has mass appeal, particularly for U.S. customers. A side note on that with the 50 plus, I also noticed that you offer different different uh, levels of uh, a trip where you can you can have one that's really rigorous or a moderate or, or hey, let's let's chill out while we while we discover. True. Yeah. The, the, the beauty of having such a broad range of trips and the ability to operate in multiple destinations is, is that you can offer up kind of broad range of um, of how you want to travel. And I'm sure we'll talk about it in a minute if you want to take a slowish relaxing culturally immersive trip through europe that's great if you want to go and hike the dolomites and be a bit more active if you want to go to you know kilimanjaro and climb that or the inca trail you absolutely can you know we feel that we're pretty inclusive in that way but what if you want a relaxing trip to kilimanjaro <laughs> you, you, you can say look you can, you can certainly do that. Most people who go to Kilimanjaro generally want to have a crack at walking up it. It's not easy, uh, but that's generally what people want to do. But if you want to go to some of those amazing bucket dis destination lists and just do it culturally and slowly and, you know, lie in a hammock in Costa Rica on the beach and then go and see a museum in the afternoon, you can absolutely do that. And that's probably the middle ground of the bulk of our tours is people wanting that cultural experience with a lot uh, you know a small group of like-minded people well let's let's start talking about these newest tours the ones that you're highlighting yeah look absolutely europe I, I guess two things to say on that first is since covid is somewhat behind us and people are traveling again the rise in travel to europe has been huge you know we've got countries like italy up 118% on pre-COVID levels, Spain 152%, Greece 55%. And we're seeing that come from, from the US as well. People wanting to get back to those classic destinations and see the, see the world again. And you saw a bump when the, the testing to return to the US uh, was, was uh, ceased, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, everyone talks about it. That pent up demand was, apps, you know, people just hungry to get back out and see something. But what we were seeing, people weren't then quite ready to do that, you know, bucket list destination in a, a far flung destination. They wanted to go somewhere reasonably comfortable, reasonably safe, somewhere that was a bit of a known entity and just get back into that spirit of traveling and, and having a great vacation again. 
But I know for the U.S., uh, we didn't want to go on a bucket list trip and then get stuck in the bucket. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. So now that's not the issue anymore. And, and I, I think for some destinations, we'll still see a slightly longer um, bounce back for some of those reasons. But Europe is absolutely firing on all cylinders. So I guess before we get into specific trips, uh, and I, I don't want to talk about COVID. That's just so tiring. It's, it's yesterday's how, news, right? Yeah, how did you survive COVID? It's obviously you did. And so as we move on, it's like what on the tours that we're about to speak uh, about, what changes have there been in the way you tour that's residual uh, that we've learned from COVID that's now just the normal? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I think for me, there's been two or three key observations. People want absolute clarity around safety and, and all of those things, as you might expect. But as you said, let's not talk about COVID. What we are seeing is people don't want to rush. They want to really go and enjoy being somewhere um and the other thing we've seen is a massive rise in solo travel not singles necessarily but people who for whatever reason you know they might be a different life stage with their partner their their holidays don't sync up we've seen a 60 percent increase in 60 percent of our passengers booking currently are solo travelers and i think the reasons being is Joining a small group with 10 or 12 people, it's a, you, you're with a community of people from day one. You've got a, you know, you've got a, if, if all being well, you've got a friendship group, you've got like-minded people, you can enjoy the experience together. But our trips build in a lot of downtime as well. So we don't pack you in a bus for 12 hours. We give you a lot of free time. So there's a community of people if you want it, and there's plenty of downtime if you want to go off and do your own thing. And that, I think we're going to see, particularly in the small group space, I think we're going to see that solo traveller being a a real cornerstone of of that sector. And then lastly, I would say it's never been the number one reason for booking with us, but it's starting to come up in the rankings of consideration is that the sustainability factor and knowing that you're travelling with a light touch and the places that you'll visit You're doing some good for the communities in which you visit in terms of working with local operators, staying in smaller hotels so that the money's staying in in the country, but also that the the trips are more sustainable and you're not damaged, you know, your carbon footprint is lower. And I think, again, over the next few years, as people are, as companies sort of become much more transparent about A, the carbon footprint of their trips and B, what they're doing to mitigate that, I think people are going to gravitate towards those businesses and those trips where you can see that it's a, a lighter touch form of travel. And we've done quite a lot in that space around transparency on that. You have four uh, tour types that uh, you're highlighting right now. The new Eclipse tours, the new UK tours, uh, wildlife tours and the food and drink tours. Let's talk about each of them slowly and uh, get our arms around the ideas. Yeah, so let's kick it off with the Eclipse tours. Obviously, they are a periodic thing. You you have to have a you have to have a great Eclipse, and um, they are from historically phenomenally successful. the The major Eclipse tours we have this year are in the US because that's where the the Eclipse are. Um, they're they're already selling pretty fast. So what we do is we combine that with a great experience and an itinerary. So it's not just about the Eclipse. But the eclipse is kind of the centerpiece of the experience of going. And as I say, whenever we run eclipse tours, they sell out really quickly because it is it's a once in a lifetime for many people. It's a once in a lifetime experience. And for U.S. customers to have that in their backyard, as they did a couple, I think the last one was about three or four years ago. Again, phenomenally successful and high demand and just just a unique experience, I think. So let's talk about that. So I'm showing the Capitol Reef National Park in Utah. Yeah. The Navajo Nation's Monument uh, Valley in Arizona are are two hotspots. Absolutely. Yeah. And you will get great, hopefully get great visibility on the the eclipse there. Plus, they're just great places to visit anyway. Right. And then you add an eclipse into the mix and suddenly you've got a pretty wonderful experience. Right. So so suddenly you have to look up instead of down. Yeah. Which, you know. You have to point the phone up and not that way, right? So, uh, again, you talk about slow travel and being immersed in the experience, and Eclipse does take you into that sense of wonderment and amazement that perhaps is, sometimes has been lost in some of that mass 
tourism and the clips trip is a real opportunity to take a step back and just experience the wonderment of nature and for me that's the joy of traveling and that's you know that's how we've always traveled and that's the ethos behind the business now uh you have offices in the u.s it's not like you're a stranger uh no. but uk is where you're based so let's talk about the uk tours yeah look and probably a lot of um, a lot of operators would say that the one thing without trying to you know COVID did some good things. It made you pivot your business and think a bit differently about things. And we had, although we'd been a 40 year old British company, we'd never really run trips in the UK. And because people couldn't travel, we right. were like, hey, let's build some UK trips. And so yeah. we built about 12 itineraries last year and they sold out because that's all you could buy. But they are, they're great itineraries. You know, they are doing things in the UK like, the Cornwalls and the Northumberlands and the Pembrokeshire coast, but doing it in a small group. And that's quite a new thing for the UK market. And what we're seeing now, and we're introducing more trips this year, is the UK is such a loved, Europe generally, but the UK is a loved destination for US travellers. You know, they come and they do London or they, you know, your first trip you do London and then you might do Scotland. But now you can come to the UK and you can do a seven-day, 10-day trip an immersive experience, see parts of the UK that you wouldn't see in the normal, you know, normally it's go to London, get in a bus, travel down, see Stonehenge. Now it's 10 days with 12 people with a great local leader who knows, and you're going to see parts of the UK that you wouldn't have seen before. You know, the coast of Northumberland, for example, even as a person living in the UK, no one goes there. And it's, it's so beautiful. And it, it's an opportunity to do something in the UK that's a little bit different. And we think, you know, born out of necessity, but they've now become a fundamental part of our program. And we think for, for U.S. customers and then Australia and New Zealand customers that they're, they're going to be a big hit and they're here to stay. And I, I, I couldn't rave more about them. We're, we're so happy. No, no. I, I'm glad you got really good at your own tours in your own country. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, I know, right? I know we did that here, too. I mean, uh, people found our, our own backyard quite interesting. Uh, I think all countries did that. Uh, let's move yeah. on to the wildlife tours. I mean, sustainability as, as a subtopic. Look, wildlife tours have always been popular, you know, whether it's going down to Borneo and seeing the gorillas. And it, it's always been. But again, it's it's been, I don't know if it's a COVID impact, that wanting to get back to nature, being more appreciative of nature, wanting to relate to, uh, I, I'm kind of maybe, glass and straws is but there's definitely something in here and we've seen our interest in wildlife tours are about 40 percent up uh, on pre-covid levels some of these things are because of some of those longer haul destinations aren't there but there's definitely been a move to wanting to get really uh, closer to nature again maybe it's sitting indoors and watching wildlife programs while, while we're all stuck indoors you know and then wanting to go and see see the reality of that so and again that's a trend that we think will will continue and again you marry up wildlife tours with solos there seems to be a thing that um and maybe it's a because your 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 partner or your friends don't share the same interest so again you know you can go on a wildlife tour with 10 or 12 like-minded people and, and get close to that nature that 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 that's kind of stimulated your desire to go on those trips. So where are your tours, uh, where are the wildlife tours going? Africa, obviously. A a Africa, Borneo, we've got, we've got some now happening in sort of Central and, and Southern America. Pretty much everywhere we travel, you can travel with us in, in a wildlife form. Of course, the safari type destinations are always going to be high on, on, the, on those wildlife trips. And but we don't do it. We do it in a very small, intimate way so that it's as much about being in the destination as it is, is chasing the, the wildlife. Again, with that sustainability factor factor in mind. Now, on all these tours, <clears throat> you're eating and drinking, but you have tours that are just about that. Let's talk about those. Yeah. Th again, the last few years, a, a huge increase in um, food tours. So, for example, you know, you go to you go to Europe. And everyone loves going to Europe. But one of the quintessential pleasures of Europe is the food and drink offerings, right? So if you start designing your tours around not only being in the destination, but marrying that up with whether it's wine tasting, 
or seeing how local produce is made. So, for example, we have great trips in Spain and Portugal where it's about see the destination, still see the highlights, but then go and if you're in Spain, go and do some wine tasting. Let's take you to a local vineyard. Let's see how the grapes, you know, let's see how the wine is made. Let's drink it at the source where it's bottled. And I think that really marries up a destination with its, um, you know, they're, they're famous for their produce. Spain, Italy, they're famous. France, they're famous for these things. So go and, go and have an amazing experience, but then get really close to the, the, the means of production and, and feel that you're experiencing it in the plate. You know, that people just love that stuff at the moment. And we're, it, over the next probably 12, 18 months, we're probably going to launch about 40 more dedicated food and wine programs around the, around the globe. And we know U.S. travelers love them. Well, I see you, you've got uh, how, how spice is grown in India. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a pretty, that's, that's, I, I would be interested. We all, you know, we all eat, we, most, a lot of people, they love Indian food. They love, you know, uh, Asian food and it's pretty unique, right? So that old spice root concept, where do these spices come from? Uh, the importance of the spices to the, the, they're such an intrinsic part of the way of life in those destinations. Why wouldn't you want to go and to India, see the highlights, you can still see the Taj Mahal, mm -hmm. but really what drives cultures are community, food, drink, being together. And these tours kind of bring all those elements together. And I think it just gives you a way better sense of place than just whizzing around with 40 people on the coach and just hopping off Taj Mahal, ticket off your bucket list. Food and drink is a really deep way into the culture, right? So you, you touched on it briefly in, but but overall uh bookings from 2019 to the present and projections for 23 uh how are you feeling look really good it's been a it's been a step stepping back into travel and there's been a few full starts as we as we all know kind of where we're at now we're booking at 2019 levels for most destinations that are fully open europe is above 2019 and for other destinations, we're starting, it's starting to creep up beyond 2019 levels. I don't have a crystal ball. And the, the last two years have taught us anything is there's no certainty around what may or may not happen. And the travel industry is particularly prone to all manner of uh, yeah. uh, events outside yeah. of its control, as we well know. I think this is, this is my prediction. Late 23, 24 will be a golden era for I, I think we'll see we've seen it in the past that bounce back from global events you always see travel have some of its best years I think 23 24 we will see travel coming back at record numbers but I think my prediction beyond that is we will see a, a def a slow but definite migration from sort of mass tourism into smaller group or lighter touch travel I think the way people travel will certainly change over the next three or four years more rapidly than it did before. But we're forecasting our 23 numbers to be really good, but 24 we're anticipating a real kind of hockey stick in terms of because of our sector and the way that we, the, the way that we travel. You said you don't have a crystal ball and anything can happen and, and, and the travel is affected by so many things. And so right now we have these airline cancellations. How is that affecting you guys? Look, it's it, it, it's really tough, and it's things have just rebounded more quickly. You may remember in COVID, said things will never be the same again. But hey, humans are pretty resilient, right? And the minute you can do something, and it is like it was before, people are desperate to get away. And airlines operators, some of the agents on the ground that run the trips, they're just a bit rusty, right? They don't they don't have the staffing levels. They're not used to processing the volumes. It's causing some challenges. It's some. I, I think it's some short-term pain. I think if the travel industry is good at one thing, it's it's extreme resilience. They will get it right, and it will get better. And I think my sort of comment to travelers are: don't let it be a barrier. Maybe a bit like the old day. You know, you go back 20, 30 years ago. The hassle was a bit of a. You know, the logistics of travel was a bit of a chore, and maybe we're experiencing a bit of that again, but I wouldn't let it be a, a barrier to going. 
you just might have to anticipate that the, the wheels are grinding a bit more slowly as we get back into full operational mode again. The, we touched on sustainability. Is there anything specifically that uh, Explore Worldwide does that's really proud of uh, in that category? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Alan. We are extremely proud of a major initiative we did this year. The sustainability has always kind of been at the heart of, of what Explore does. We, we haven't really shouted about it. You know, we, have a, we acknowledge we have a responsibility. We send people all over the world on long haul flights and we have an impact on the destinations. So the first thing we needed to do was understand what, what is our carbon footprint? Because so we've been through a huge undertaking. We use an external partner and we've measured the carbon on all of our trips. So everything from the hotel you stay in to the food that you eat to the transport you use. And we've come up with a pretty accurate carbon score for each trip. So now when you go to our website against every trip, you will see the carbon score of that trip. And we acknowledge for some trips, you know, if you're taking bullet, you know, if you're going to Japan and you're doing bullet track, the carbon and you're taking internal flights, the carbon footprint is quite high. But we believe it's better to be transparent about that because then customers can choose how they want to travel, how frequently and understand the impact. So that's one part of the ledger. The second bit is until you know that, how can you mitigate? So we're, so the first thing, and we're really proud to do this. And I think we're the first operator of our scale to be fully transparent on every trip, but we're committed to reducing our emissions 50% by 2030. Some of that will be industry led airlines will get, you know, more efficient. Some of it be through government legislation, but our part, is now to talk to our operators and our agents and our suppliers and our partners to find ways in which we can bring that carbon reduction down. I come from that generation that was fortunate enough for travel to be a, a relatively easy thing. We want to preserve that for future generations. It's, it's one of the best things you can do. It brings people to closer together. We also have a, a really good impact on the communities that we traveled through in terms of GDP and adding jobs into the local sector that the money stays in the communities there's real benefit to travel done in the right way so the uh, the long-term answer is not traveling the answer is be transparent mitigate hold yourself to account and continuously improve so we're, we're pretty proud of that to be honest with you i like when i well I, I don't know if i like when i go to a restaurant and i see the calories and i have to order based on calories but i do like that i can go to your website and look at my carbon footprint for each trip i like yeah. that the, ca the calorie thing's funny right who wants to go to a restaurant and be reminded about this great night that you're having is that you've overdone your calories for the day the pleasure's gone i think it's a bit different with I travel think it's a lot different i think this is you feel really good about your eating here <laughs> yeah absolutely and for us it's not about not traveling we say maybe travel a bit less or travel a bit longer or smarter so, or smarter, just travel smarter. That's that, that, that's the best way to put it, yeah. I understand the impact you're having and make sound choices, but don't not travel. I think it's one of the, 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 the gifts we have as humans is to be able to go and experience other cultures. But we've got, to, we've got to understand the impact we're having and we've all got to play out. I mean, I think ultimately that will be the solution. It won't be the big items. It will be lots of that ripple effect, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of people just doing things a little bit better. And I think that's, that's the key to, to, to improving the situation. Okay. Uh, to summarize, Explore Worldwide uh, offers unforgettable experiences, expert local guides, small groups, and sustainability. A lot of companies say that. What makes you guys different? I think what makes us different is... We've been doing it for 41 years and we, we've been doing it because a couple of guys started the business out of the love of traveling on the beaten track. And we've never, we've never lost sight of that explore. Hopefully, you know, when people call us, they will hear it in the way that they get serviced and the way that we talk about destinations. We are a passionate bunch of travelers. Sure, we're a business and we want to grow, but we've never lost sight of that original spark that made us want to do it in the first place. And that's what we live for. Having our staff not servicing customers for two years, it was a pretty grim, depressing experience because our staff are passionate, our travelers are passionate, 
And I, I think that's the difference. And people, people get it right. People can tell businesses that do it for passion uh, and they do it out of the love of the original reason that they started. And I, I think and I hope that's what sets us apart. We go out to over 100,000 travel advisors every day. Uh, if they want to work with you, what should they know? What should they do? Okay. F- first, firstly, they can find us at exploreworldwide.com and then they can call us from the, from the numbers on that website. We, we have staff in, in the US ready talking to travel advisors every day. I just want to say one thing about travel advisors. We've worked with them in our 40-year history. There is no one better for, our, for a customer to talk to than a travel advisor. You know, our trips are, we've got lots of them. They're complex in that sense. People have a lot of questions. And travel advisors are just brilliant at being that intermediary between the customer and the trip experience. And in an era where people want accountability, what if something goes wrong and we know things go wrong from the last years, you want somebody who can hold your hand through those problems. And nobody does that better than travel advisors. So we absolutely love working with them and we, um, and we hope they um, pick up the phone and give us a call. It works both ways. I'm sure yeah. uh, you make them look good and they make you look good. And- it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a great partnership. Yeah. And it works really. A- anyone that doesn't work with travel advisors is, is missing a trick, in my opinion. Well, you've said it to the right, uh, you preach to the right choir. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear it. So, okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for talking to us and good luck. Thanks, Alan. I really appreciate talking to you. It's, it's, it's been good fun. And this is Alan Fine for Insider Travel Report.